Thank you. Thank you, uh, Avi, and thank you, Ran, for inviting me. And uh, this, is, um, this is joint work with uh, Rohit Gorjar and Thomas Tiralf. They're both at the University of Aalen, but they have offices at the University of Ulm, which is close by. And uh, this is, that's the link to the ECC C version, which is currently there. All right, so I'll just start off with some basic definitions. I think that, that, that we, we probably, most of us know this. So if I have, I have a graph, um, and the matching in G is a set of edges that, uh, where each vertex is incident to, at most, one edge in the matching. And for perfect matching, which I'll just abbreviate as PM, we substitute the word exactly above. So every vertex is incident to exactly one edge. Uh, perfect matching is also called a one factor. So in the perfect matching decision problem, which I'll call PM, just asks if you've given a graph, does it have a perfect matching or not? So yes or no. Uh, there's also the search problem where uh, you're given a graph and you want to actually come up with a perfect matching if there is one. Many times the search problem reduces to the decision problem in a reasonable way. Um, matchings and perfect matchings have been studied all over the place. There's a huge literature on this subject and uh, it's too much to go into now. So I'll just uh, keep going. So let me just mention some previous algorithms for these problems. Uh, long ago, it was 50 years now, there's a um, polynomial time algorithm for perfect matching, and it's due to Edmonds. So this is an old, old result. Uh, there's been a fast randomized parallel algorithm for perfect matching, and this was due to Lovas, and it's been improved fairly recently. Uh, by Chari Ragati and Sriva Srinivasan. So what did they do? Uh, they, I think they reduced the time and also the number of random bits, but it's still, it's, it's still, you know, big O of n plus some log factors. And there's an uh, RNC algorithm for the search problem due to Karp, Upfall, and Widgerson. Uh, from the 80s. And uh, there is another version of this due to Mulmuli Vazirani Vazirani using a lemma called the isolation lemma, which I'm going to, I'll talk about later because uh, what our work really does is sort of, de as much as we know how to do, de randomizes this lemma. So just just so we're all on the same page, NC is the class of problems with uniform polynomial size circuits with polylogarithmic depth. Um, and until now, for polylog depth circuits solving perfect matching, at least uh, even for bipartite graphs, nothing better than exponential size uh, was known or is known at this point still. But uh, we've actually now, our results reduced this for, um, for bipartite graphs. Uh, so this is still open, and unfortunately, but I, I think it's true. Is there a fast parallel non-randomized algorithm for perfect matching? So we don't, we don't solve this, but we come as close. I guess we come fairly close. Uh, so we. We have a polylog depth circuits, but the size is quasi-polynomial. So it's going to be 2 to the log squared of n size. All right, so let's look at some deterministic parallel algorithms for this. So there are NC algorithms for certain types of graphs that are known. So these are non-random. So uh, for example, uh, graphs that don't have the complete uh, bipartite uh, on, uh, graph on six nodes. This is due to Vazirani. Graphs having polynomially many perfect matchings. Um, <coughs> uh, bipartite deregular graphs. Uh, this, was, um, this was done by Lev Pippinger and Valiant in, in uh, 81. Um, there's also another algorithm due to um, 
Sharon, is that how you pronounce Sharon in, in Wigerson? That uh, uses a different technique that works for um, three regular graphs, for cubic graphs. Uh, strongly chordal graphs, uh, planar bipartite graphs. So if, you, if the graph is planar and bipartite, you can de-randomize this. And uh, this, uh, this, this paper by Data, Kulkhani, and Roy actually managed to de-randomize this isolation lemma. So some of these results actually get it by de-randomizing the isolation lemma in certain cases. So our work is that uh, bipartite perfect matching and the search problem for bipartite graphs <coughs> are in quasi-NC. So they have, and in fact, what we can do is we can, uh, they have uniform circuits of depth log squared n and size 2 to the log squared n. We also have a random, uh, an RNC2 algorithm, so uh, it gets depth big O of log squared n um, using only log squared n many random bits. So in fact, you could take the latter algorithm and just you know, try all possibilities and you get the former. But uh, this, one, this one came later. But if any questions, just you know, interrupt me. That's fine. All right, so what I want to do is I want to give the, um, I want to talk about the isolation lemma and how it's used to, to get a, an RNC, a randomized NC algorithm for, for bipartite matching. So I have a graph with bipartition. Uh, the vertices are, 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 are put into two, into two different sets here, uh, the, left, the left vertices and the right vertices. And we're given a weight function and, uh, f uh, that gives edge weights in po positive integers. And we'll extend W to sets of edges where we just, count, we just add up the weights of the edge in the set. And that's the, the weight of the set. So we d define this matrix, which is looks like the the bi adjacency matrix for the graph. What it is is if you um, if uh, UI is connected to VJ, then we let the entry be two to the weight, two to the power of the weight, and if it's not connected, we just put a zero there. So if we define that matrix. It depends on the weight, obviously. Then if you take the determinant and you take the usual expansion of the determinant as terms, you get, you know, uh, the non-zero terms are going to take a weight from every row and every <coughs> column and uh, multiply them together. And that adds up the exponents. And so the terms actually correspond exactly to the perfect matchings of the graph. And the size of the term is 2 to the weight of the matching. But now you've got this as either plus or minus, depending on the sign of the corresponding permutation. So what that means is that if, if, if G has no perfect matching, then this determinant is always 0, no matter what the weight function is, because you just don't have any non-zero. If perfect matching, then it still might be 0, because uh, uh, because you might have cancellations because of this sign term right here. All right. So we want to choose a weight function that avoids the cancellations. And one way to do that is for the weight function to isolate the minimum weight perfect matching. So we'll call a weight function W isolating if G has a unique minimum weight perfect matching with respect to W. So if, this is, if you have an isolating weight function, then and G has a perfect matching, then the determinant will always be non-zero because the minimum weight term doesn't cancel with anything else because all the other terms are higher powers of 2, strictly higher powers of 2. So you get this one term that doesn't cancel anything else, and so you get a non-zero determinant. The weights are integers? Ah, yes, good. Uh, weights are integers. Um, I don't think they have to be positive, but uh, they're definitely integers. Well, I guess you want them to be at least zero, because you want that ma matrix to be an integer matrix. So, 
All right, so the isolation lemma says that, so if you have an isolating weight function, that's good. Basically, you can then reduce it to the determinant, and there's a parallel algorithm <coughs> for the determinant. So the isolation lemma says that if you just choose the weights randomly from, uh, um, from the set 1 to 2m, where m is the number of edges, uniformly, independently for each edge, then W is isolating with probability at least 50-50. So this is the randomized algorithm. You choose a random weight function. And that gives you, and then you compute the determinant. And these numbers are small. Um, these numbers are small enough that you can do the determinant in, uh, in NC2. So if W is isolating, which happens with high probability, then you, can al you always get the correct answer using computing the determinant. And there's an algorithm of Berkowitz from the 80s that does this in, in NC2. All right. So we want to de-randomize this lemma. So here's a, here's a weight function that's not random. And it's clearly isolating. And it's kind of stupid. You just enumerate the edges from you can see that, right? My, OK, good. So you just enumerate the edges from 0 to n minus 1, and then you define the weight of the ith edge to be 2 to the power i. And in this case, w is clearly isolating, because any two sets of edges are going to give you different weights. But you can't compute the determinant now efficiently because now the, the matrix entries are way too big. So the weights are 2 to the i, and then the matrix entries are 2 to the weight. So now you, you're doubly exponential in m. And that's just uh, too big an input to do efficiently in small depth. So what we do is we do kind of a standard trick, sort of a standard trick. We reduce the weights modulo small numbers j. And uh, this, is what, this, is, this is what's going to work for us. So you fix an integer. So fix an integer j. So I'm going to fix this weight function w. So we'll call this the, the uh, proto weight function, I guess. And what we just do is we just uh, reduce it mod j for every edge. So w mod j of e is just you take the w of e, which is a power of 2. And this is the, op the mod operator, so dividing by j and taking the remainder. And do this for all edges. So for we collect these j together. So we take j's, all possible moduli, from 2 up to some number t, which we'll define, we'll choose later. Um, and we get a set of weight functions out of that. And I'll call that capital W sub t. So this is just a set of weight functions. They're not too big, and uh, there are t many of them, or I guess t minus one. Uh, yes, t is going to be polynomial in n. In fact, t is going to be n to the sixth. Or all right. So I'll, I'll come back to this in a, in a couple of slides, but I have to I have to talk about circulation next. So if I have a cycle. Cycles come up in perfect matching because if you take two perfect matchings that are different and look at their symmetric difference, that forms disjoint cycles. It's not too hard to see. Um, if you have a weight function on a graph and you have a cycle, uh, 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 important quantity is its circulation. So we're going to define a cycle. Let C be a cycle where the edges here, E1 to Ep, are given in cyclic order. And uh, G is assumed to be bipartite from now on, and so, so P is going to be even. So given any weight function W, the circulation of C with respect to W is what you do is you take, you alternately add and subtract the weights around the cycle and take the absolute value. That's called the circulation. And um, <coughs> It doesn't matter where you start because you're taking the absolute value anyway. So suppose you have two matchings. 
uh, given a weight function w, you have two minimum weight matchings which are different. That means w is not isolating, and so this is, this is a bad case. This is a case we want to avoid. Then m1 and m2 differ on disjoint cycles. And furthermore, these cycles all have to have zero circulation. And here's a way to see that. So I have, here, here are the cycles where they differ, say. Okay. So suppose some, one of these cycles has non-zero circulation. Suppose like the, the middle one right here, this octagon, has non-zero circulation. Well, you have the blue matching and you have the red matching. And they alternate along the path. So one of the, the blue weights added up is, is going to be different from the red weights. So what you just do is you just swap the blue and the red edges along this, um, along this cycle. And that's going to change the weight of both matchings. It's going to increase one and it's going to decrease the other. But they're both minimum weight, so you can't decrease them. So that's a contradiction. So you can't have non-zero circulation. So what we want to do is we want to choose weight functions that force non-zero circulation uh, with, to as many cycles as we can, and we're going to choose them from this set. So we'd like to choose a weight function from this set, and I'll, let's recall what W sub T is. W sub T is this collection of weight functions where you take the proto-weight function, the powers of 2, and just mod out by various j's, j going from 2 up to t. And you get these weight functions. You get this set of weight functions. And we want to choose a weight function from this set that gives non-zero circulation to as many cycles as possible. So if we do that, we're going to make progress in preventing these two unequal minimum weight cycles, essentially. Okay, But we can't do this for all cycles at once, because there are too many of them. So uh, there are too many cycles. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going we're to work in stages. We're going to force non-zero circulation on small cycles first. And then we're going to get another graph out of that, which it provably has no short cycles. And then we're going to try again, look at the cycles of that graph, force non-zero circulation. And we'll do this in stages uh, a, log many, a log number of times, log of n many times. And eventually, <coughs> we'll get we'll get a, a, an isolating, an isolated perfect matching. So in order to do that, but in stages, yeah. Right, yeah. So, so the, the fact that you, that, that you could do this in stages. It, it was r really just kind of, yeah. Just it, it, it was not. It was not obvious at all. Um, so there are two key lemmas for this, and this is the first one. This is saying that uh, that you can force non-zero circulation for any set of of s cycles at once. So let s be a positive integer, and so S is just fix S as a positive integer. And now T, this T, which is the maximum modulus of this set, just set it equal to n squared times S. Then for any set of S many cycles, there always exists one of these weight functions from this set that gives non-zero circulation to all of them at once. And the interesting thing about this is it doesn't depend on what the cycles are. It just depends on S. Yes, absolutely. Right, right. Yeah. So this is the, yeah. So we only we only need it for cycles. But you're right. This is this is for any for any arbitrary sets. Okay. So we'll see later uh, that we can apply this where s is only n to the fourth, so only polynomially many cycles, even though there are exponentially many cycles in the graph. If we're only trying to force non-zero circulation for small cycles, there aren't very many of those. There are only polynomially many, n to the fourth. And um, 
So if you take n, s being n to the fourth, then t is now n to the sixth, which is polynomial n. All right, so what we do is uh, just, so just recall how we take, we take uh, each, each edge weight of the proto weight function, the power of two weight function, is taken modulo some j, and now j is up to t, and t is now n to the sixth. So you can store these, store each of these weights in six log n bits, okay, or big O of log n bits. The six is not really important. All right. All right. So this is the other key ingredient: is the idea is the derived graph. So now suppose G is bipartite. It has a perfect matching, and W is, is now it's just some arbitrary weight function on G. The one that was uh, giving all the short cycles not zero synchronization. Correct. That's what yeah. you're thinking about. It, the lemma ah. is uh, for arbitrary, but that's what you use it with. Yeah, that's what I use it with. Good. Yeah. So think of W as being these weights that give non zero circulation to these short cycles. So the derived graph of G with respect to W. It's the spanning subgraph of G, and I'm, gonna, I'm using this notation, this is not in my paper, uh, G of W, where E prime is just the union of all the minimum weight perfect matchings of G. So you look at G, it's got at least one perfect matching, so it's got a minimum weight one. There might be more, more than these, which of course is bad. But you take the union of all of them. So you take the, the edges that only participate in some minimum weight perfect matching with respect to W. And now here's here's key point. All cycles in the derived graph here have zero circulation with respect to W. Okay. Um, this is good. This means that if we can force non-zero circulations on small cycles, and all cycles have to have zero circulation, that means that this derived graph has no small cycles. So we're killing off small cycles in the derived graph and saying, okay, so the graph has to have cycles of at least a certain length. But the is GW is different than G. You make I mean, it's not obvious that GW will be different than G. R with because you take the union of some matchings, but maybe it's all the edges in the original graph. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, th th it's possible that GW is equal to G. But so this is not at all obvious. Um, uh, and uh, we had a proof of it. We, have, we proved this lemma using some linear algebra, just using the edge space. Uh, uh, edge space over the real numbers, not over the two element field. Um, later, there was an alternate combinatorial proof, and it was found by Rao, Schwilke, and, and Widgerson, and uh, it's reported in Goldwasser and Grossman back in December. And this is a, this is a nice combinatorial proof. Um, I, I actually think that these two proofs are fairly similar to yeah, each other. <laughs> yeah. They capture the same thing. It's just yeah. They they arguments, but, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there's some kind of translation between these two. All right. And there's a corollary to this, which is also useful. And that all perfect matchings in the derived graph are minimum weight perfect matchings of G. So you could imagine you take G and you take the union of all of these minimum weight perfect matchings, you're throwing in all these edges. Maybe you're throwing in another perfect matching that's not minimum by doing this. This doesn't happen if G is bipartite. It turns out that you don't get any new perfect matchings in the derived graph. So all the perfect matchings in the derived graph are the minimum weight perfect matchings in G. I guess this corollary is equivalent to the key match. Uh, yeah, I, it, 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 it maybe so. I, I see one direction. I, I, Maybe the other. The, so one direction is, I mean, if you have a non-perfect matching, 
of G, well, a non-minimum. Um, then you look at the, t take a minimum and take a non-minimum, look at the cycles where, the, the, where they differ, and now um, one of these has to have non-zero circulation because they have different weights. So yeah, okay, I guess that's the, uh, that's the, that's the easy direction. All right, so how do we remove short cycles? From the derived graph, we give them non-zero circulation by the, by the lemma. So I, I, I'll, I can prove the lemma time permitting, uh, but I, 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 I delay the proof to the end because I don't think the proof add, adds anything to the development. So we're just gonna assume the lemma is true. So in steps, we're going to remove cycles from derived graphs whose lengths are increasing powers of 2. So first, we force all cycles of length 4. That's the smallest cycle you can have to have non-zero circulation. So the derived graph has no cycles of length 4. Then we take the derived graph and give it a new weight function, removing cycles up to length 8. How do I take a very good question? I'm glad you asked that. We don't really know because it's not, this is the derived graph is actually not part of the algorithm. We don't have to compute the derived graph. These derived graphs are just used for the proof of correctness. What happens is we don't know what weights we're gonna use, so we're gonna try all of them in parallel. That's, that's, that's the punchline, so. All right, so if we go by increasing powers of two, so you know, we eliminate cycles of length four, then length, length eight, then length 16, and so forth, at each step, there aren't that many cycles to eliminate, and that's by the following, that's by the following uh, lemma. Um, so suppose, let G be a graph with no cycles of length up to R for some even R. So G, the, the shortest cycle in G has length bigger than R, um, if it has a cycle, so it, it's girth. Then turns out G has, has only this many cycles at most of length up to 2R. So it has polynomial cycles. If it has no cycles of length less than or equal to R, then it only has n to the fourth cycles at most of length up to 2R. this on the next slide, but let me just mention how we use it. So what we're going to do is we're going to give all these cycles non-zero circulation by some weight function chosen from our magic set. And then so these cycles cannot exist in the derived graph with respect to W. Okay. And then we'll take a, we're going to take a series of derived graphs, one derived from the previous one, until we get what we want. All right, so let me just, uh, this lemma is, is cute. It's, uh, it's not hard to prove, so let me just actually prove it. Um, this is based on a, an earlier result of Teo and Co, who showed that the number of minimum weight cycles in a graph is close to m squared. Um, it comes from here. So suppose G has no cycles of length up to R, and R is even. Consider any cycle of length up to 2R, here it is. Now, because of its length, we can choose four vertices around the cycle in cyclic order, counterclockwise. So U1, U0, U1, U2, and U3 spaced evenly enough apart so that the distance between adjacent vertices along the cycle is at most R over 2. All right, so the length is at most 2R. These are at most R over 2. Well, it turns out that this is, if you're given these four vertices, this is the only cycle which satisfies this property that goes around these vertices in order with length at most r over 2 in e on each segment. Uh, and this is, let's see why this is true. So um, suppose there's another cycle that does this. We'll call it C prime. This is the red cycle. Well, C prime might coincide with C on some of the segments, but then it's going to differ at some point because it's different. Look at any point where they differ, let's say between U1 and U2. 
Now C prime has the same property that the distance between these vertices is at most r over 2. Well, if you just look at the one segment where they differ, whoops, wrong way, you get two different paths of length r over 2. They have a form a cycle in there of length at most r, but g has no cycles of, of, of up to r, so that's impossible. Okay, so, th so there's only one cycle that gives you those four vertices in that order with that property. So the number of cycles of, of length up to 2r is no greater than the number of four tuples, ordered four tuples of vertices, which is n to the fourth. So that's the proof. Okay. All right, so let's put this together now and get a sequence of derived graphs. So we start with the original graph G. Uh, and bipart and we'll, bipartite, and we'll assume it has a perfect matching. Um, if it doesn't have a perfect matching, our algorithm will detect this at some point. So let's set G0 equal to G, and we'll start with G0, and now we'll get a series of derived graphs. So we'll choose some weight from our magic set that kills that uh, such that all cycles in G naught of length up to four, which is the shortest you can have, have non-zero circulation. And there are only n to the four of n to the fourth of these by our previous lemma. So we can so we can do this uh, by by the lemma that says that T T is big enough to do this. So we choose some weight function that gives non-zero circulation, and now we set G1 to be the derived graph with respect of G, or of G0, with respect to W1. So G1 has a perfect matching, because it's the union of minimum weight perfect matchings of G. But it has no cycles of length 4, because all its cycles have zero circulation, and we've just set non-zero circulation to the cycles of length up to 4. Okay, so that's G1. Now we repeat the same thing now with G1 instead of G0. So we choose another weight, W2, such that all cycles in G1 of length up to 8 have non-zero circulation. And by the previous lemma, there are only at most n to the 4 of these cycles. So we can choose W2 in our, so we know there's a W2 in our weight function that does this. And now we let, let the consider G2 the derived graph of G1 with respect to this new weight function. G2 still has a perfect matching and no cycles of length up to 8 because those, those cycles all have zero, all its cycles have zero circulation. All right, so we keep doing this. And so in the ith step, you choose w sub i such that all cycles in, in, in uh, g i minus 1 have length, um, all cycles of length up to 2 to the i plus 1 have non-zero circulation. And then you let g sub i be, uh, be the derived graph. All right, and you keep doing this. And if you do this for log n minus 1 many rounds, you get to this G sub K, which has no cycles of length up to 2 to the K plus 1, but that's bigger than N, or that's, uh, that's, that's equal to or bigger than N. And so G K has no cycles at all, but it still has a perfect matching because there's a perfect matching that survives through all of this. So G K is a perfect matching. Um, and uh, so it's, a, it's some perfect matching. And this perfect matching might depend on how we had our choices for the w sub i. But still, we get a unique perfect matching at it the end. It doesn't have to be a perfect matching. Okay, it doesn't have to be. That could be other way. It's a union of perfect matching. Oh, it's a union. Yeah, right. right. Sorry, it's good. It has to be a perfect matching. Sorry. Ah, yeah, yeah. All right, so what we want to do now is we want to sort of glue these W sub i's together to get that this perfect matching is isolated as a unique minimum weight perfect matching of the original graph G. 
So here is now an isolating weight function for G. So we glue these weight functions, these step-by-step -step weight functions together into a single weight function. So let B be a strict upper bound on any edge weight from any of these. And because of, because of the weights, we can take B, for example, to be n to the sixth. Okay. So it's not, not too big. And now for each edge, we define this master weight function, <laughs> W sub E, which is just um, <coughs> descending powers of B multiplied by the, the, the various weights as their coefficients. So you should think of these weights as being in in order of priority. So the most significant weight is the first one. And then after that, w sub 2. Uh, you can think of this just as a number base b, where these weights are now are just the digits. OK. So that's our weight function. And now the claim is that if g has a perfect matching, then this weight function is isolating for g. And in fact, it's going to isolate that perfect matching that's the edge set of G, G sub K. All right, so let's see, let's, let's see why that's true. So what we've been doing is we start with G, and we keep taking derived graphs. So the edge sets are forming a descending chain. Um, with respect to containment. And they end with a perfect matching M of G. And this is just the edge set of G sub K. So M, M is like at the end of the line. This is, there's a unique perfect matching at the end if we choose these weights functions the right way. OK. Now suppose there's another perfect matching of G, call it M prime, which is different from M. We want to show that the master weight function gives a higher weight to m prime. And that'll isolate m. All right. So if m prime is different from m, then m prime doesn't survive to stage k. There's some point, there's some stage i less than k where m and m prime are both in g sub i, but m prime doesn't survive to g sub i plus 1. So it just, it's not in the derived graph of g sub i. It's in g sub i, but it's not in the derived graph of g sub i. Well, so m, and m, m is in all of these graphs. m prime is in all of these graphs up to i. Well, these are derived graphs. So m and m prime have the same minimum weight with respect to all of these weight functions, that's how you get into the derived graph. You, you have your perfect matching of minimum weight. So they all have the same minimum weight with respect to all the weight functions up to w sub i. But m prime is not in g sub i plus 1, and m is. So it must be that the weight, the i plus first weight of m prime is bigger than the i plus first weight of m. That's how, G, that's how m prime doesn't get into the, the derived graph. Well, now you have all the weights from w1 to wi being equal for the, two, for the two matchings. And now you have this discrepancy. Well, the way we constructed the master weight function, those are just the significant digits of the master weight function. And then what happens after i plus 1 doesn't matter. At this point, we know that. The, to the master weight of m prime has to be bigger than the master weight of m. And so w is isolating. It isolates this. OK, good. So this approach, we know that this approach, if these weights, if these w sub i's are cho chosen correctly, we know that we're going to get in some isolating weight assignment. So we don't know which one of these works, so we try them all in parallel. So each one of these weight functions uh, is, takes order log n bits, but there are k of them, and k, you might recall, was log n. And so when you put these all together into a single weight function, it takes up log squared many, uh, about log, order log squared n many bits. 
Okay? One of these choices has to be isolating. So what we do is we try all of these in parallel. That will be 2 to the big O of log squared of n. That's where the quasi nc comes in. And for each one of them, we compute this determinant as in the RNC algorithm of, of MVV. And you know, for bad choices of WI, you might get 0. You don't get the right answer. But if, w, if G has a perfect matching, the determinant for the correct Ws is going to give you a non-zero determinant. And if G does not have a perfect matching, then you'll never get anything different from 0. So you just run all of these in parallel, and if at least one of these <coughs> determinants is non-zero, then you know that G has a perfect matching. Okay. This? Yeah, so we have an integer matrix. Yeah, uh, so, uh, sorry. This is I, I introduced yeah, this as part of oh, as yeah, part of a so previous RNC algorithm. Yeah. yeah, so sorry about that. Yeah, that's uh, okay. So that's going to continue. The, the so we choose. Uh, so we choose each one of these separately. Each so each uh, we choose W one out of n to the six many weight functions. Yeah, he talked about this. So there's a universal set of uh, you know, this master. And maybe we should write it yeah, down. I'll write it down. It's, it's, it was a long time ago. So you have the proto weight function. Can, can you see this? The proto weight function that just enumerates the edges in some order and gives 2 to the i to the ith edge in, in, in that enumeration. And then. W is basically you take uh, mod J, is you take W E mod J. So you're taking, you're taking this single weight function and you're just modding it out by all possible numbers J from 2 up to T. And T here is n to the sixth. So these are, these are easy to construct deterministically. Uh, in parallel, and you're just trying all. So basically, for each stage, from one to k, you're choosing this modulus j, from one, to, from two to n to the sixth, and then you're computing this weight function, and you throw that into the matrix, and you do the um, determinant. So Hold on. It's my thing going to sleep. There we go. Okay. All right. So each each one of these component weights takes six log n bits to store. So W takes order log squared n bits, basically. So you process them all in parallel. And this can be done with circuits of this size. And depth log squared n. Now, there are some technical issues here. The, the entries of this matrix that you're computing the determinant are actually quasi polynomial size. If you just do Berkowitz's algorithm on, quasi, on a quasi polynomial size input, it's not going to be depth log squared, it's going to be depth log to the fourth. Or we have three or four, yeah. It it's still it's still an NC algorithm, but it's just the its depth is higher than what I'm claiming, which is log two. So, just hand wavy. How do we get this back down to log squared depth? You basically you you pick a, 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 take the first some number of primes and you reduce these determinants mod those primes and you're now you're essentially doing the determinant in Chinese remainder form. And you don't have to combine it at the end because 
Yeah, you're right. You're just you're checking if, if a determinant is zero, and if it determines zero, if and only if all its Chinese remainders are going to be zero. So it's what you did on the exponent phase. Now you do on on the put the. Right. Yeah. So it it it, it, it it's a little bit tricky. So the number of primes you have to choose is about. Um, I think it's uh, quasi no you, the quasi polynomially many primes, and so each prime is going to be about log squared n many bits. And you can do divisions, and you can, you, you can reduce the exponent using Fermat's little theorem, and there are tricks you can do to get the, to get the way. I, I don't want to go into details, but you can, you can actually get the depth down to log squared n if you do it carefully. So. Um, all right, I think, how much time? I got a little. You can, uh, you can prove it, yeah. I can prove the count? OK, all right. Um, this is the linear algebra proof. So, because <laughs> uh, I did, I, I thought about uh, actually doing the alternate proof. Um, I, I could do it on the board. Well, let's 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 do it. Okay. So we let r to the e. E is the edge set of the graph. We let r to the e just be the m-dimensional real vector space uh, where you just take the edges of G as your labeled basis, and then any. Uh, any set of edges in E is going to correspond to a 0, 1 vector in this vector space. So this is, this is like the edge space of the graph, except that it's a vector space over the reals instead of the two element field. So, uh, but you can still associate any set with its 0, 1 vector, so its characteristic vector. So um, if, if uh, S is a set, then S sub E is going to be 1 if E is in, the, if e is in the S and it's 0 otherwise. Okay. You, you know, the key lemma is that uh, reduced graph has uh, uh, zero circulation. You are reminded of yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, I should definitely remind you. So let me remind you what the, key, uh, what the key lemma says. So derived graph, this is the union of min weight perfect matchings. So we fix a weight function w. Could be any weight function. And uh, so the lemma, the key lemma, says that all cycles in the derived graph have zero circulation. So if you add and subtract the edges around any, cyc any cycle in the derived graph, you'll always get zero. OK, so that's, that's the key lemma. All right. Um, so let me, so we set this up. We set this up so um, any set of edges is going to correspond to a, a, a zero, one vector in this vector space. So this is a standard definition, the perfect matching polytope of G. You take all the perfect matchings of G as 0, 1 vectors, and you just take their convex hull. So it's all, all the convex combinations of perfect matchings of G. So there's a. Well, no, I'm not sure who actually proved this first. It's in uh, Lovas and, and Plummer. Um, if G is bipartite, then you can characterize this, this polytope with these linear constraints. So uh, a, a vector x is in this polytope if and only if, well, all the components have to be at least 0. And if you take any vertex and look at the edges incident to that vertex, so this is the edges incident to that <coughs> vertex, they sum up to 1. Okay. Now, if x corresponds to a perfect matching, then it clearly satisfies this, because every vertex is going to have exactly one edge coming out of it. And so th there, one of these terms will be 1, and the rest will be 0. And of course, all the entries are 0 and 1. Um, and this is obviously a convex set. So, uh, um, 
So one of these directions is, is obvious. If, if you are in PM of G, then you certainly satisfy this. The other direction is also true. It's not so obvious. It's not too hard to prove. But it only works for bipartite graphs. So there are, there, and in fact, this is, this is a key reason why our algorithm doesn't work for general graphs. Because we need this. We need this for bipartite. It, this only works for bipartite graphs. Um, so the lemma I'm trying to prove also only works for bipartite graphs. In fact, I can give you a counterexample. Let me give you a counterexample of a non-bipartite graph. So we put zero weight on those. It's like a prism. We put zero weight on the end edges, and we put one weight here. OK. Um, So there are, uh, if, you take the, if you take this graph and you take its, deri uh, take its derived graph, well, it's derived, the, the, the minimum weight perfect matchings weight are, have weight one. And you get, let's say, by taking, for example, that edge, that edge, and that edge. That will give you weight one. Okay. You get all edges back. Yeah, but you get all edges back because you can rotate this. And so you get all edges back in the graph. But now this graph also has a non-minimum weight perfect matching. These th three has one of weight three. And that was a corollary to the, non to the zero circulation result. So this violates the corollary, so it violates the circulation. So this only is true for bipartite graphs. All right. OK. So. The forward direction is clear for any graph. The converse only holds for bipartite graphs, not necessarily for general graphs. Um, also, fairly standard, we would extend the weight function w to all of the vector space here just by linearity. So if, if x is a vector, its weight is, well, you take the contribution of each edge into the vector and multiply it by its weight. And that would be a standard way of defining it and, and just sum that over the, over the edges. All right, so here's what we do. So let x1 through xt, t is a different t now, be vectors corresponding to all the perfect matchings of g with the same minimum weight q. So x1 through xt are, in fact, the minimum weight perfect matchings. So they. Uh, um, their union would be the derived graph. Okay, if we took them as sets of edges, their union would be the derived graph. So they all have the same minimum weight q. And now all we have to do is look at, oops, sorry, look at their average. Just add them all up and divide by t. Call that vector x. So x is some right smack in the middle somewhere of the perfect matching polytope. And its weight is obviously q, because it's just it's the average of these weights, which are all q. Furthermore, every entry of x, if I take an entry of x in the derived graph, then that satisfies its, its value is at least 1 over t. Because if it's in the derived graph, one of these vectors has 1 as that entry. And so if, even if all the rest have 0, you divide by t, and you get at least 1 over t. Okay. So what that means is that at least on the edges in the derived graph, that positivity constraint is, is, is not tight. And so we can tweak x a little bit and still stay in the perfect matching polytope. All right, so suppose. Suppose I have some cycle C in the derived graph G prime, and it has non-zero circulation. So without loss of generality, 
the blue edges are going to outweigh the red edges, say. Okay, so you add up the blue edges, you're going to get some that's bigger than the weights of the, of the red edges. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to define a new vector, y, and it's going to be obtained from x by subtracting 1 over t from the blue edges and adding 1 over t to the red edges. So the entries of y and, and all the other edges, the, the entries of y are going to be the same as the entries of x. So the claim is that y is still in the perfect matching. Okay, so why, uh, oh, is that true? Well, take any vertex outside here. We haven't changed anything, so the sum of the incident weight uh, edges is still 1. Here, the only thing we've changed is added something and subtract from one edge and subtracted it from the other, so that doesn't change the sum of the weights. Furthermore, on this cycle in the derived graph, all the entries of the vector are at least 1 over t. So they're still, po they're still at least 0 in the y vector when we do this. But basically now what we've, do is we, what we've done is we've added more, more influence to the smaller weights and taken it away from the larger weights. And so if we compute the weight of y, it's equal to the weight of x minus this correction term, which is exactly the circulation of c divided by t. Okay. And this is, this is assumed to be non-zero, and so this number is positive, and we're subtracting it. This is q, so we get something that's strictly smaller than q for the weight of y. But now we use the fact that y is this convex combination of perfect matchings. So there has to be some perfect matching contributing to y that has weight less than q, but that's a contradiction. So that's the linear algebra version of the proof. And then, like I said, there's a nice combinatorial version. Um, I can say it in one sentence. Uh-oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I mean, assume that there is a cycle with non-zero circulation, just like, like you're showing now. The edges in this cycle come from this minimum weight perfect matching. Mm -hmm. So let's take them all. There's some number of perfect matching. And let's look at their union. The union is a regular hypersite graph. Right. Multigraph. Multigraph. Yeah. Yeah. Regular hypersite multigraph. Right. And the one thing you have to use, and uh, it's easy to prove, that in every regular uh, hypersite multigraph, there is a perfect match. Right. That's all you need to know. So now, what you can do is you can change your multigraph from the one you have by Removing, I don't know, the red, replace the red ones by making parallel blue ones. Right, yeah, so you take out the red ones and take you, out the yeah. Red ones, take out the big ones, put mm -hmm. the, the, the smaller weights. Actually. Yeah, I guess the opposite. So take the blue ones the out one and then make, yeah. Ones, yeah, right, yeah okay. <laughs> and then you get the new multigraph, which right. is also in your reduced graph because it's still using the same edges. It's still mm -hmm. regular, so it has a perfect matching. But in right. fact, you reduce the average weight of the total perfect matching, so one of them has to be. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. That, that, that's nice. Uh, I think if uh, I give this talk again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. I, just, I, had the, I had this written up already, so I was just being lazy. It's really <laughs> the same book, but you don't need to have the fractional. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I guess just... Um, At the end, my convexity, whatever you prove about the fractional weights, you, you get for some extreme point. Right, all right. Yeah, if you take this and multiply both sides by t. Yeah, yeah, so you just blow everything up by a factor of t, and then now you're adding and subtracting yeah. 1. Yeah. So it's just you're, you're like moving edges around. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Um, let me just mention, um, I'm over time, but okay. I, I just want to quickly mention um, our RNC algorithm. This is the one um, that uses only log squared, order log squared, and many random bits. And what you do is you take the proto weight function, the powers of two, and instead of modding them out for all j, you just pick you you mod you mod this uh, out by choosing random primes. So let j be some random prime. 
And then any set of S many cycles has non-zero circulation with high probability. And if you do this in k rounds, if you make the probability high enough, then um, the chances that you'll get an isolating weight functions are still pretty high when you, when, you, when you glue them all together. You have to do something a little bit different with the determinant. It's not quite the same. So that's, uh, that's not important. We have a few other results. These are really just taking our results and filtering them through previously known results about reductions from perfect matching <coughs> or, or reductions to perfect matching from other things. So weighted perfect matching, these are all on quasi and C with po quasi polynomial bounded integer weights. Maximum bipartite matching, uh, cardinality wise. Um, cycle cover with polynomially bounded integer weights. Can you find a minimum weight collection of disjoint vertex disjoint cycles that covers the whole, all the vertices? Um, Subtree isomorphism, max flow with polynomially bounded integer capacities, and constructing a depth first search tree. So those are just some other results. Okay, so again, I'd like to thank Ron Roz and the rest of the faculty for inviting me. And um, we uh, had a lot of help from Manindra Agarwal. So uh, Rohit Gurjar was Manindra's student at Kanpur. He's now at, at, at a temporary position in Ulm. And Ethan Saxena. And also Arpita Korwar, who discussed techniques on the RNC algorithm. So, all right, thank you. I have references there. Thank you very much.